I'll ask you to <clears throat> turn to the book of Ephesians this morning, Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. We begin a new series in this wonderful uh, book today. And we'll consider verses 1 through 6, but I want to read verses 1 through uh, 14, just so you have the flow of the apostles' uh, thinking here. Uh, verses 3 through 14 are actually one long sentence in the original uh, Greek language, the kind of sentence that uh, English teachers would torment us with if they <laughs> asked us to diagram such a, a beast as this. But then we'll return and focus on just the first few verses today. Paul, of course, spent uh, about three years in this city, uh, far longer than he spent uh, anywhere else. His um, his preaching and teaching and leadership had very significant ramifications, not only uh, spiritual but even economic. Uh, you know, someone has defined preaching as the fine art of talking in another man's sleep. <laughs> Whoever. <coughs> it's one of those things that's painfully true, I'm afraid. <laughs> Whoever said that must not have heard Paul preach because it was highly unlikely for anyone to, although there was one example, one young man slept through one of his, but it was very late at night. But for the most part, uh, his preaching was riveting and controversial and even to the point of causing a riot in Ephesus when he was there. Of course, other people were converted by what he had to say, and a, the upshot of it all was that a very strong church was established, a, a strong church church built on solid uh, doctrine. Sadly, though, through the years, as you know, churches change, and over time, the church in Ephesus uh, lost her first love, which serves as a sober reminder that uh, sound doctrine is not necessarily a guarantee for the health and longevity of any particular church. Well, let's pray, and we'll dive in. Father, we thank you for your word and for your gospel and for your great salvation. As our choir just sung, we, we would offer our hearts to you promptly and sincerely. And we offer all that we have. And so we, to that end, we pray that you would uh, bless us, open our ears and hearts to hear what you have to say to us. Uh, make us teachable. Uh, fools despise wisdom and instruction. So beginning with the preacher and with all of us. Uh, we submit ourselves to you and your word and pray that your spirit would lead us and guide us into truth, that we might be a, a strong church, not only doctrinally, but in our love for you and our love for each other. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his own will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also... When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. 
<clears throat> all flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. I think Paul was in a good mood when he wrote uh, this letter to the Ephesians. In fact, I think he was in a very good mood, perhaps even ecstatic as he uh, began the letter. You notice that he, he barely says, hello, <laughs> greetings, and uh, then he, he burst into this great doxology. And keep in mind that we believe this letter was written from prison. Would you be in a good mood if you were in prison? This was probably written during Paul's first Roman imprisonment. He says hello, then he bursts into a doxology of praise, giving thanks to God for a lot of things. You say, well, like what? Well, first of all, for the way God has blessed us. Verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He hasn't blessed us with one or two blessings. Uh, he hasn't blessed us with a blessing here and a blessing there and a blessing this week and maybe a blessing in a few more months. He's held nothing back is what Paul is saying. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. You'll notice that verse 8, he uses that word lavished. He's lavished his blessings upon us. We don't look like it. We've got these long faces, you know, and we, we muddle through life. But uh, this is what Paul says. It's what the Word of God says. He's held nothing back. There's been a veritable downpour, a flood of blessings. Every one he has to give, he's given and held nothing back. <clears throat> you ever had the experience of going to a nice restaurant, maybe a very expensive restaurant, and uh, you're, you know your bill's going to be about this big, and uh, it's all right, but the, the meal is about this big. <laughs> a couple of years ago, Kristen and I were in Chicago with Rachel, and we'd walked around the place all day and decided we'd go to the Trump Hotel. Never been there. Right on the river. I went to the Trump Hotel, and we were impressed, and we decided to have dinner in the Trump Hotel. Thought we were big time, didn't we? And we sat down, and <clears throat> Rachel ordered uh, some sort of exotic duck or quail or something. And no sooner was it served, and we laughed as soon as the waiter left. We laughed. It must have been a midget duck. <laughs> or a miniature quail or something, because it was about like this. Far more plate than there was food. And yet the bill was like this. By contrast, when Kristen had surgery a few weeks ago, you lavished food upon us. Thank you. We, th we thought we might have to go buy another freezer just to take care of the food. And it's a, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, that's the idea here. God's not stingy. It's not, not like this. It's, it's everything he has to give. He's held nothing back from his people. Now keep in mind, these are spiritual blessings, not material. That's not what Paul has in mind here. These are not things that we can... Uh, and touch and hold and, and necessarily see. They're, they're spiritual blessings. For example, he mentions our adoption in verse 5. Um, and he predestined us for adoption as sons. John says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed, some versions say, lavished upon us that we should be called sons of God. We're sons, we're daughters of God. We're, we've got a place at his table, a permanent place in the family, never to be unadopted. We're like little 
crippled Mephibosheth in the Old Testament, remember? Who uh, <clears throat> King David showed such kindness to and gave him a permanent place in the family and at the table, even though he belonged to a rival family. We're adopted, and, and in verse 7 he mentions uh, we have redemption. We've got forgiveness of our sins. That's a big one. And the more cognizant we are of how sinful we are, the, the, the greater this blessing is to us. All our sins removed as far as the east is from the west. Scarlet sins washed whiter than snow. In verse 11, he mentions our inheritance. as something waiting for us that no eye has seen and no ear has heard, nor has it entered the heart of man, the things God prepare, has prepared for us. And finally, in verses 13 and 14, he mentions the guarantee of this inheritance. That is the Holy Spirit, who's a down payment, a deposit of sorts, guaranteeing that this inheritance is ours. Elsewhere in the Bible, we, we read of various and sundry things, like the peace that passes understanding. What a blessing that is. We read of uh, the Holy Spirit who prays for you and me. He intercedes uh, for us with groanings too deep for words. Even the Lord Jesus Christ himself ever lives to make intercession for you and me. We've got Jesus praying for us. We've got the Holy Spirit praying for us. We're in good shape, friends. And of course, one of the best of all, all things work together for good for those who love the Lord. These are the spiritual blessings that we often forget or depreciate that have been lavished upon us. My minister friend, uh, Joe Novenson, some of you know this story, was a newlywed working in Spokane, Washington uh, with corrugated sheet metal and the first day on the job his hands got caught in the roller and he had to have 14 surgeries he had to have, keep his hands above his head for a year even when he slept couldn't feed himself, couldn't dress himself couldn't do much of anything for himself and of course sometimes when he slept he'd have nightmares and flashbacks and he'd reflexively pull his hands down. So he asked his wife to read the Psalms to him. And then his mother would come visit and he'd ask her to read the Psalms. And she wasn't a believer. But night after night, <clears throat> as she read from the Psalms, God saved her. She was converted. And Joe was led to leave the sheet metal business behind and go into the ministry. All things work together for our good. These are the spiritual blessings he's lavished upon us. Secondly, we notice not only has he blessed us, he chose us. <clears throat> Verse 4, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. See, a long time ago, God had a book. And in that book, he wrote our names. <laughs> it's a beautiful truth. We weren't around yet. The world wasn't around yet. Nothing was around but God. And in the mind of God, we already existed. And in his book, he wrote down our names. It's known as the book of life. Paul uses this word predestined. Verse 5, he predestined us for adoption. And he uses it again in verse 11. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Predestination means exactly what you think it means. We just have a habit of sort of tiptoeing around it. It means to determine the destiny beforehand. 
It means that God chose us a long, long time ago. It was his purpose. It was his plan. It was his book. And he decreed that we would be his people. Why are you a Christian? Assuming you are. Why? Why are you here this morning? A lot of people aren't. They're out there doing things they consider important. Why are you here on this bleak morning worshiping the Lord? You say, well, it's <laughs> a silly question, preacher. I'm here because, you know, years ago I repented of my sins and I put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and asked him to be my Savior. Yes, very true. But why did you do that? Why did you repent of your sins a long time ago? Why did you ask the Lord to save you from your sins a long time ago? Paul says it's because you were predestined to do so. In other words, to quote the prophet Jonah, salvation is of the Lord. God's not some passive spectator sitting on the back row of the stadium hoping we run the right play. Praise God he's not. We'd never run the right play. He made sure we ran the right play. He's the head coach, if you will, working all things according to the counsel of his own will. Of course, it raises other questions in our minds, doesn't it? Why did God choose me? It's a good question to ask. And as far as I know, the Bible doesn't give a good answer, a clear answer. What it does tell us is that predestination is the act of, an act of love on God's part and grace. Do you notice those last two words of verse 4? In love, he predestined us. It's an act of love by the grace of God to the praise of his glorious grace. You read those words where is it? The end of verse 6. To the praise of His glorious grace. I like the way John Newton put it. What was John Newton's famous hymn? Amazing grace. Let me tell you, it's more amazing than we think. <laughs> this grace of God. John Newton said, I believe in the doctrine of election because I'm quite certain that if God had not chosen me I should never have chosen him. And I'm sure he chose me before I was born, or else he would never have chosen me afterwards. And he must have elected me for reasons unknown to me, for I could never find any reason in myself why he should have looked upon me with such special love. I don't know why predestination gets such a a bad rap. <laughs> but it has. And, and yet it's simply, the Bible is simply assigning God credit and glory for our salvation. Not you and me. We'd never run the right play. God always runs the right play. And you may be interested to know that in spite of all the hubbub and controversy and disagreements about the doctrine of election or predestination, that most of the mainline denominations throughout history have embraced it and given it creedal status. The Roman church has, the Episcopal church has, the Anglican church has, the Lutheran church has, the Baptists, the Methodists, the Presbyterians have all given this creedal status historically. Now, the profession or the practice may not always match the profession or the preaching may not always match the creed, but at least throughout history, the churches have recognized what's plain as day on the page of Scripture here and elsewhere. So it puzzles me sometimes as to why this has become so controversial and divisive among churches, 
denominations, pastors, families. It's a great story about Martin Lloyd-Jones who believed in this strongly, but his brother Vincent did not. And the two were vacationing at their, uh, at their uncle's home one summer and they got into an argument about it. And it started at lunch and it continued through tea and it continued to late afternoon, continued after dinner. And it only stopped when Vincent lost his voice. <laughs> but Paul, you see, Paul doesn't argue about it. He's celebrating it. And you know why? Because Paul knew himself to be the chief of sinners. He knew himself to be a, 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 a man who was persecuting the church and all too happy to do so. He was a man who was trusting in his own resume. Pharisee of the Pharisees, tribe of Benjamin, circumcised the eighth day, blameless under the law, he thought. And he thought he was in good standing with God. I believe Paul thought that God was so proud of him. Way to go, Paul. You're my man, Paul. Keep persecuting those Christians, Paul. Good thing for Paul that a long time ago, God had a book. And in that book, he wrote Paul's name. Why? Not because of Paul's resume. Not because Paul would later become a missionary. Not because Paul would later write a lot of the New Testament. Not because of Paul at all. If anything, it was in spite of Paul. It was because of God's love that he pitched upon this man named Paul a long time ago, even before the foundation of the world. And that is why the Apostle Paul celebrates this doctrine and announces it unashamedly, as should we. We are where we are. We are who we are. We are worshiping the one we're worshiping today because a long time ago God thought of us and he saved us from ourselves in his mind before the foundation of the world. And that's why at a particular time and, and point in history God has intervened in our lives even as he did so dramatically with Paul. He stopped that man in his tracks. You know the story. And he arrested him. And the scales fell off his eyes and the chains fell off his heart and he, he rose and went forth as a new man. That old way was a way that seemed very right to Paul. But the end of which is death. The only thing he had going for him and he didn't even know it, as none of us knew it, is that a long time ago God had a book and in love he predestined us. We chose him because he first chose us and we love him because he first loved us. So that's why I say that grace is more amazing than most of us realize. God has blessed us. God has chosen us. And finally, a very quick word, God is changing us. He will change us. Again, verse 4, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. If you're here this morning and you know yourself to be the chief of sinners, those words sound very, very good to you. Holy, a word that's almost disappeared from the Christian's vocabulary today, and blameless. We hear it all the time that God loves us as we are. Yes, he does, but he loves us too much to leave us that way. And he is determined that whoever has been justified will be sanctified, and will one day be glorified, pure and blameless. You know, a, a man and a woman meet, and they, they may date, and they're attracted to each other, and fall in love, and get married, and live happily ever after. Right? <laughs> No amen. <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong. 
That's the way it's supposed to be, anyhow. <clears throat> but this thing's different because God wasn't attracted to us because we were so beautiful spiritually. Just the opposite. We were quite a mess. And he pitched his love upon us in order that someday we as the bride of Christ might be the most drop-dead gorgeous thing we've ever laid eyes on. Without spot or blemish or wrinkle, he will say later in this very same book, as a matter of fact. He chose us in order to make us holy and blameless, in order to one day present us faultless before his presence with exceeding joy, in order that one day we might be given fine linen, clean and white, given to the saints, which stands for the righteous deeds of the saints. When the marriage of the Lamb at long last will come, when like stars his children crowned, all in white, shall wait around, pure, holy, blameless. God's plan was never just to save us from hell, but rather to conform us to the likeness of his perfect son, our Savior. And so it's all by the grace of the Lord. You notice how many times we read here, these, these blessings are in Christ or in Him or in the Beloved. It's all by His merit and by His grace that His, His perfections, His righteousness will be one day fully imputed to us and it will be as though we'd never committed a single sin or ever been sinful. It's almost too good to be true, but it is most definitely true. And so we pray and sing, as the hymn writer expressed it some time ago, finish then thy new creation, pure and spotless let us be. Let us see thy great salvation, perfectly restored in thee, changed from glory into glory, till in heaven we take our place, till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love, and praise. <clears throat> Father, thank you for predestining us. We don't understand all this. It's way beyond us. But we give you thanks for what your word says to us. And we know that it's only by your electing sovereign love that you diffuse that quickening ray. Uh, we who are otherwise imprisoned in sin's dark night. And uh, we awoke by your grace and the chains fell off, and we, we follow you because, of, because salvation is of you. And so we give you praise and thanksgiving and, and rejoice that you will complete the good work that you've started. Uh, we, we wish that we were holy and blameless now, but we rejoice that nothing can thwart you and nothing can stop you and you will sanctify us. You are doing so and you will one day glorify us and we will be forever with you. Lord, we get so focused on this world and, and uh, we know you want us to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world, but uh, grant us wisdom to set our affection on things above as your word says and to look for that city with foundations whose builder and maker is God we bring our needs before you we we lift up Denny Brownlee having surgery tomorrow bless him and keep him we pray and for Camille Ivey mourning the loss of her mother grant her grant her that peace that passes understanding and and um 
divine comfort in the days ahead. We pray for the many among us that have had surgeries and are undergoing treatments and therapies. We, we pray for Christy Frazier, for that your mercy will be upon her in full measure. And all the others, grant us grace, O Lord, to fight the good fight, to keep the faith and finish the course. In the name of Christ, our captain, we pray. Amen.